Good evening, everyone, and welcome to ILAD's third informational workshop. Uh, my name is Tom Easterday, and I have the, uh, the honor and privilege of being the president of ILAD. I'm going to take just a, a couple minutes to talk to you about ILAD, and then I'll in introduce uh, Michelle, our program manager, for the program this evening. Um, first of all, our mission. Uh, ILAD stands for Independent Living for Adults with Developmental Slash Intellectual Disabilities. And our mission really is three-pronged. Number one, it's to provide housing, which I'll talk about in a few moments about our proposed development, Crossbridge Point. Uh, two, enrichment and educational programs and programming. And, and obviously the program this evening is a part of that, uh, part of our mission. And the third thing, of course, is to provide social options. We know how important that is for adults with developmental and intellectual disabilities. We are informed by our self-advocates. Uh, we're proud to have, uh, Katie, if you can stand up for a second, one of our members of our board of directors, Katie Shaw, is one of the self-advocates, one of the two that serve on our board of directors. Uh, we get a lot of input from our self-advocates at our Family Connect meetings, which you'll hear a little bit more about later. Um, we get a lot of input from not only the families themselves, but certainly from our self-advocates uh, with regard to our programs, our social options, and our housing. We we'll talk a little bit about our enrichment and educational programming. Um, certainly one of our goals is to help all individuals we can with intellectual and developmental disabilities be able to thrive in an independent living setting. Whether that be someday at Crossbridge Point, or whether that be on their own in the community or in some other setting. To do that, we have to provide programming that helps give them those skills or helps reinforce the skills that they already have. So one of the key things that we do at ILAD is provide independent daily living skills, functional skills, occupational skills, social skills. Uh, we've had pilot classes so far for interaction skills, for uh, cooking, which is going on right now as a pilot program, and also for safety. And we'll be rolling out programs with regard to those independent living skills in the near future. We also have several other programs that we are looking at providing in the future and that we provide now. I'll talk about a few more of those in just a moment. The social activities and outreach. Um, here we're providing already uh, a lot of fun things, um, but they're also tied in with the educational focus that we have for ILAD. Uh, Book Club is a good example of that. It meets every Wednesday at Panera. And the book club, of course, we're enhancing and also furthering the social skills. Uh, they go up and buy their food and, and drink sometimes. Um, and we have interaction between all the self-advocates that are there. But we also enhance the reading skills and kind of reinforce the reading comprehension skills. But uh, overall, I think it's a lot of fun. I know Katie's been a member of the book club for a long time. Hiking club. Hiking club meets once a month, typically on the third Sunday. And we've gone to a variety of state parks, uh, also Eagle Creek Park and Starkey Park here in Zionsville. Um, it's a lot of fun. We hike two to three miles, uh, spend a couple hours together socializing and also getting more physically fit. Uh, game nights. Game nights are definitely fun. Uh, game nights are the second and fourth Thursday of each month, and they are currently held at the Books and Brews in Zionsville. And game nights, um, basically, it is what it says. Uh, they go and play games, and it's a lot of fun, too. Uh, everything from Jenga to bingo uh, to, gosh, Uno and a variety of other games, and just have a great time at, at game night. Uh, this summer, we had a fitness club outside. That was a lot of fun. And there are a lot of other social activities being planned and events, and we're going to be partnering with some other organizations. We've already partnered with, uh, for example, the Boone County Sheriff's Department, uh, with regard to that first responders training, which was great, that was held at the end of August. Of course, the informational workshops. Um, two of them have already been held. We had at Guardianships and Supported Decision Making and Alternative Forms of uh, Assistance that was presented early in the year by a, an attorney in, from Indianapolis Force. We also had a uh, parents panel, um, and there we learned from um, some parents how they help their sons or daughters to move out of their home and, and live on their own. Um, tonight, of course, we're going to learn a lot more about waivers uh, that support independent living. So we want to know, want to make sure that everyone knows, too, that our programs are not just for potential residents of Crossbridge Point, but really any individual, any adult individual with an intellectual or developmental disability, and certainly parents and guardians, caregivers, and the community are welcome to our programs. So at the beginning, I mentioned our three-pronged mission, uh, one, housing. Second, educational 
and enrichment programs, and third, the social options and outreach activity as a part of that. Crossbridge Point is the development that we have planned for the future. We're looking at properties in the Whitestown area right now, and uh, we hope to have a very inclusive and neurodiverse community. And what I mean by neurodiverse is that it would include individuals with disabilities as well as individuals that do not have disabilities because we want people to, again, live independently and be fully integrated into the community and welcomed into the community. And we encourage people um, at Crossbridge Point, we hope to have a transportation uh, lying close by in Whitestown. They have a transportation system. We hope to be close to that uh, so that they could go out into the community, not only for social activities, but certainly for job opportunities also. Uh, we already have quite a few of individuals that we serve at ILAD uh, that actually work in the Whitestown area now. So Crossbridge Point, um, approximately 40 to 60 individuals will be living there. There may be some homes that would have uh, one self-advocate, sometimes they would want to have a, a roommate in there, so it might be two or possibly even three uh, living in the homes. And we want to make it very, very easy for people to interact. Again, trying to get that social activity going and to make them feel comfortable in the community. And as well as being a very safe home, we want it to be a very welcoming home. So like to have front porches out there so they can walk out and see their friends, see their peers, and be able to interact on a daily basis with them in the green space uh, between the homes there. In addition to that, we hope to raise enough funds that we would have a community center. And when I say community center, I truly mean that in the sense of the entire community would be welcome in, uh, not only to interact with our self-advocates and those other, other individuals living at Crossbridge Point, but also to make sure that uh, groups from the community, for example, nonprofits, could utilize our community center uh, if they don't have a place to meet. Uh, we'd like to have Special Olympics events in there. Hopefully we can have at least, at least a half court basketball court. I mean, it is Indiana. You've got to have a basketball court, right? Um, and we'd have an exercise room and hopefully also a teaching kitchen so that uh, we can continue on with uh, classes like cooking class in the future. Um, also, we would hope to someday invite in there um, other types of training, possibly some vocational training, and it can be used uh, certainly for uh, other activities as well, social activities. So that's a little bit about ILAD and also Crossbridge Point. Um, if you want to contact us, I know you already know how to contact our program manager because you're registered for tonight's program. Um, you can reach me at teasterday at iladinc.org or also you can reach us by email uh, there at the info at iladinc.org or at that phone number. So again, welcome. Thank you for coming out tonight. Um, I know we may be expecting a few more coming in. And uh, to those of you watching on YouTube, thank you for tuning in to our YouTube channel and to ILAD's informational workshop. So now it's my pleasure to introduce our program manager, uh, Michelle Gray. And Michelle's gonna talk a little bit more about tonight's program. Thanks, Michelle. Hello, welcome. Um, we are going to talk more about waivers tonight. Um, there is a, the whole function of ILAD, as Tom indicated, is to help our um, self-advocates and individuals move to a greater, uh, place of greater independence. And we wanted to talk about how can, um, utilizing those waiver services be beneficial to you and your self-advocates as they work to become more independent and possibly consider living on their own. So we have invited um, two different um, individuals to speak with us tonight. The first one is Bridget Lawson and she's a case manager um, and she's going to talk about waiver services from the case manager perspective and how to get started and how to utilize those services. And then we have another speaker who is um, on the 1102 task force and um, is go also a parent and she's going to give us updates um, on the, the progress of the committee. So let me introduce first uh, Bridget. She is a graduate from Indiana State University and she is a certified rec therapist. Um, she is still credentialed to do that even though she has not been working as a rec therapist for a little bit of time. Um, she worked first in um, setting with individuals with developmental disabilities um, when she was 17 and she worked at the Logan St Logansport State Hospital 
And she did that for three summers, which I'm sure was a challenge. Um, she, she then worked as a re, uh, rec therapist, a rehabilitation therapist, sorry, on, and on a transitional behavior unit and on the sexual responsibility unit. And that was combined for six years. And then she began working for a waiver provider. Um, and she has uh, held a number of different um, um, positions, anywhere from direct care staff to branch director and area director as a waiver provider. And then she entered in August of 2019 the um, case management world and has been working with Futures Case Management. So um, she has a wide variety, not only from the case manager perspective, but also as a provider. And um, I'll just say that when we decided to have this, Bridget stand, stood out in my mind automatically because she's very passionate about um, her work. And um, so we we'll just want to welcome her tonight. I do want to mention, if you have any desire for snacks or drinks, they are over in the corner behind the eyelash oh, we'll table. Later, <laughs> <laughs> Please feel free to get up and help yourself. All right, let's get this started here. Well, first of all, I just want to thank ILAT for letting me come present. Um, as Michelle said, it is a passion of mine. Taking care of individuals and, and advocating for their needs um, is really important to me. Just as a little disclaimer down here, I don't work for the state of Indiana. I am not a policy person. Um, as far as any specific regulation or policy questions, um, I would encourage you to, there's a lot of resources on the BEADS website and some other avenues that um, I can't uh, quote or attest to specific policy, more generalized information. Um, as Michelle said, my background, oh, well, two things, I apologize. One, I apologize if my slides are hard to read on your printouts. When I was doing this on my computer, I didn't realize what it was going to look like on a printout. So I apologize for that. And if at any point in time I am talking too fast, or if I use a term or abbreviation you're not familiar with, please stop me. Because again, I am, I'm really passionate about what I do, so sometimes I can get really energized and I need to slow down a little bit. Um, so I'm not going to go through all of this, but like Michelle said, I, I do have a variety of backgrounds. I think that um, and experiences that bring me a lot of benefit to the waiver world. There's been many situations when, you know, maybe a case manager who's been doing this for 10, 15 years calls me and says, hey, I know you've got provider experience. What might be going on with the provider? Um, I've worked with state-operated facilities and know the pr process we're getting into. And you know, some people think, oh, just call it the state hospital. They need to go to the state hospital. Well, first of all, that's not our first resort to do. Um, and secondarily, it's quite a process to get into the state hospitals. And some people don't necessarily know that. So. Having um, a lot of experiences, uh, I think, brings a lot to the table for me when, when trying to help clients and individuals and their families. So I think um, Jill and one of their ladies has already passed out. There is a sheet that's got um, some link information for items that I think are very beneficial to families, participants, um, when looking at the waiver world. Because like I said, there may be abbreviations that I use or words, and it's a lot. Even as a case manager, um, there's times that an acronym will come up and you're like, oh, uh, what was that? So, and I believe if, if there was an issue with some of the links, so if you would like a, like a hyperlink sent to you, if you'll let them know if they have your email address, they can send you the hyperlink so you can directly click onto those. Um, but I recommend these resources if you're navigating the waiver system, especially for the very first time. Um, you know, if I sit here and say Beamer, what? I'm not talking about the BMW in the parking lot. Uh, a Beamer for us is a BMR, a Budget Modification Review. Again, just so many letters thrown together um, that the acronyms and definitions page will be helpful. And then, not knowing where everyone's from, there's a, a link to the, D, the district map for BEADS offices because you're going to want to know who your home office for BEADS is or the Bureau, as I say BEADS, I assume, Bureau of Developmental Disability Services. They're your main point of contact when it comes to waiver services. So you're going to want to know which office you are tied to. Um, I primarily service out of um, Indianapolis and Terre Haute. Those are my main uh, offices I use. And ironically, all the way north of Lafayette uses Terre Haute. You wouldn't necessarily think if you're living near Lafayette that your point of contact is in Terre Haute. So um, that those maps can be very beneficial. Um, if, in case, again, not knowing everybody's level of familiarity, if I say FSSA, DDARS, BEADS, who are they? What is their role? So kind of a hierarchy, it's FSSA, the Family and Social Services Administration of Indiana. 
Um, and then below them is the Division of Disability and Rehabilitative Services, or they're, they're DDARS, um, which DDARS is obviously a division of FSSA. But the one you're going to be most familiar with is BEADS. It's the state agency that implements and oversees the home and community-based waivers, or HCBS, um, which are the family support and community integration waivers. They are the state agency to start your waiver process. Um, and as I did put there, see your district office location if you need that. Out of curiosity, has anybody not started the waiver process that's here? I'm kind of looking for that information. Okay, go ahead. It just kind of gives me an idea of the starting point because I'll tell you, it can be overwhelming and it's okay. And it, it takes time. And I'm sure the families that are in here that have been through that process, especially if they've been in the process many years ago, um, it's, it's a lot, but there's a lot of resources out there to help you get through it. So this is, a, this is a, a very important slide to me. So often, and I guess part of me is please help advocate, out, even outside of this organization, for people that you know who maybe have said, I don't need waiver. My loved one doesn't need waiver. We have enough natural supports. We don't need other services. You may not right now, but today's not guaranteed. Tomorrow's not guaranteed. And one of the examples I gave to um, a friend of mine whose son has cerebral palsy, and they have said, you know, our insurance is covering, you know, different therapies right now. We've got grandma and grandpa five miles away. We're okay. I said, you are okay right now. What happens when you go to date night Friday night, and heaven forbid you're in a car accident, and you guys don't make it? Grandma and grandpa are now the primary caregiver. Who's their natural support? What support system is in place to help grandma and grandpa that just became the main support system? So even if you don't feel like you need, or if someone doesn't need services right now, you don't know what tomorrow brings, and you don't want to not have it because it does take time. So if you can get it started, and I'll talk later, the, the minimum to keep it maintained over time is very simple, just to have it there just in case. Or what happens if all of a sudden you've got a, a young child and they're in school, and suddenly we have a bunch of behavioral issues and your insurance doesn't cover any kind of therapy. But that waiver can get you behavior management. They can help work on those outbursts. They can help work on school homework frustrations and communication. It's not a bad thing to have the waiver. There are so many resources available to individuals through the waiver that I just really encourage that if you know someone who is hesitant to sign up for the waiver, encourage them to think of the what if. What if something happens and I can't be that natural support tomorrow? Do, does my family know how to get them the waiver supports? Because quite frankly, we're not getting the information out from enough doctors, enough school systems, and healthcare providers. I, again, I'm an advocate, so I get fired up sometimes. And an individual who graduated from the same high school as I did, her sons, unfortunately, were found floating in a swimming pool this summer. One didn't make it. The other one did, and he was in rehab at Riley. And I waited. I didn't want to, you know, they were going through a lot. I didn't want to say anything. But I knew that young man was going to qualify for a waiver. And so I waited for a while, and I finally reached out to her. And I said, you know, I don't want to overstep. I said, but has anyone talked to you about Medicaid waiver? This young man was in a Riley rehab unit. The family found out via other parents. So the information's not getting out there. Like, until they approach the social workers to say, hey, this family said something about Medicaid waiver because they can be applying for it while he's still in that rehab unit so that they can be closer to having services available to them when they get home. She ended up having to go to a social worker supervisor to help get the information she needed. And all she needed to get started, and it'll be in this presentation, is one web link. It's all it took to get started, and that's all she needed. But she couldn't get it. So it takes advocates of families, parents, caregivers, providers, to make sure that information is out there. So please encourage, don't assume that someone's gonna share that information. My sister's a special education teacher and she, I'm one of her resources at this point because she's taken over our life skills classroom and she's got students in her classroom who have not been in, integrated into the waiver system and they're about to transition into adulthood. The same ex type of uh, demographic that HILAD is really kind of reaching towards is that transitional age is a, is a big piece of it, or at least that's my perception of it. And these individuals, aren't even being set up with services. So again, please, you know, don't assume that you don't need it and encourage people to have it in their back pocket in case they need it. Okay, how does an individual qualify for waiver? 
And my big tagline, though, is when in doubt, apply. Make them turn you down because there are diagnoses that people have gotten approved on that you may not have thought of if, it, if you didn't try. For example, spinal muscular atrophy. I thought that sounded more medical. I had a participant with that as the primary qualifying diagnosis. If her parent had not taken the chance and applied, she'd probably be in a nursing home right now because family couldn't take care of her, but she has the, the large CIH waiver in her home. So again, when in doubt, encourage them to apply. It doesn't take that much to go through the initial application now that they've got the gateway up. Um, I'm all about make them tell you no. Make them be the, <laughs> the bad guy if necessary. At least give yourself the chance for the services. So diagnosis, any sort of intellectual and developmental disability, um, some, op, some examples, but definitely not limiting, mental retardation, Down syndrome, uh, cerebral palsy, uh, mild intellectual disability. Some people think that you need the full, a full diagnosis of something like mental retardation or autism, but mild intellectual disability is now one that many individuals are getting services from. Um, autism, Asperger's, and as I mentioned, there are those outlying random ones, that, that spinal muscular atrophy. It fits somewhere, but I wouldn't have thought of it. Uh, prior to 20, age 22, the diagnosis needs to occur prior to age 22 because that's what they consider the developmental age. So, you know, if someone's on the board they think, or the edge of not sure if someone has autism, for example, if they might be on the autism spectrum, they want to get that established as early as possible because you have to be prior to age 22. One common misconception, and again, it's one of those pieces to please share when you're talking to people. When it comes to Medicaid waiver, parents' income and assets do not count. So when it comes to Medicaid in general, your income and assets count, right? So if one of you in this room want to go get Medicaid health care, they're going to look at your income. They're going to look at your bank account. But if a child has a disability that qualifies them for Medicaid waiver services, you can make $2 million a year and still get wa Medicaid waiver services for them. So just as a FYI. Um, and then they have to meet level of care. So what does level of care mean? I'll give you the short version. Uh, the state does an, a level of care screening, and then we as case managers do an annual. Um, they have to have skill deficits in at least three, there's two sections, three in one area and four in the other. So it's areas such as mobility, um, understanding and use of language, self-care, uh, capacity for independent living, learning, self-direction, and then in the secondary section there's also economic self-sufficiency. So I know that's a lot of information. I was trying to be careful to not put too much in this, these slides. I would encourage you that if it's something you want to get more information about, that you know, go online, go to the BEADS website to look up those criteria. Um, because again, trying to limit how much time I have, plus it's a lot. You guys feel overwhelmed when you're first starting this out and having to learn all these different bits of information. Um, it's a lot to, to go through. But just know that they will screen, and they're going to ask you questions. Um, I'll, I'll get back to that. Oops. Sorry, I apologize for that. Maybe. Um, there will be interview processes, which we'll talk about in a minute. I guess I'll, I'll go to that next. So the BEADS gateway, this is where you begin. If you have not applied for Medicaid waiver services, this is a new website that the state rolled out um, to make the process a little bit easier. You used to have to do paperwork, and there will be paperwork. It's, it's governmental services. Um, but if you go to beadsgateway.fssa.in.gov, that's what gets you started. That's where you apply for the waiver, or apply for waiver services. Um, now, I'll disclaimer here. So, so what's next? If you fill out that gate, you go to that gateway, you submit your application, what happens next? Well, according to Beads, you'll be contacted within 15 days after you submit that. Now, we all know there's staffing shortages everywhere. There's always, you know, the pandemic has really slowed a lot of things down. Um, I know at one point, bead staff were calling every single nursing home in the state of Indiana to get a survey of how many participants were in nursing homes and have had been COVID vaccinated, things to that effect. So they're getting slowed down. So that 15 day, uh, well, I don't know if that's true. If it is, wonderful. But that's what their website says, within 15 days. Um, just for reference, items that they may request when they contact you. Confirmation of diagnosis. That is a form that you don't have to wait for them to ask for it. It is available online. Um, it's a form you take to your doctor's office that's essentially them confirming that your loved one or, or yourself, whomever it is you're advocating for, has a qualifying diagnosis. It lists their diagnosis, when it was diagnosed, 
And that's what the state's going to need to say, okay, they have a qualifier as far as diagnosis goes. Um, the level of care and then the ICAP interviews. Sorry, ICAP. Um, oh, goodness, what does that one stand for? ICAP usually is usually done with a CIH, and it's, it's not likely to get CIH, but just know there's interviews. This is key. Don't sugarcoat it. It's really hard, especially if you're talking about your child, to say they can't do something or they need help with something um, or to kind of say, oh, yeah, they're fine. If you're not honest about their areas of, of the, how do I word this, their areas of potential for services, you may be more likely to get denied because they may not meet that level of care. For example, if someone asks you, can your loved one do a load of laundry? And you may think, yeah, they help with laundry, so you say yes. But if you take it and break it down, are they doing it independently? Do they know what temperature to run that washing machine at? How much soap to put in to sort the colors? So really think about those, those questions when they're asking. And don't sugarcoat it. it it's hard. I get it. If, if someone was asking me about my niece and nephews, and because I don't have any children, but if they're asking me if they were good at something or how, how they do, I'm like, oh, yeah, they're great. But this is the time that you hurt yourself instead of help yourself if you sugarcoat things. So we want to make sure that, you know, just be real. If they, you know, if they, you say, yeah, they, they can have conversation, how strong of a conversation is that? If you ask them to tell a detailed story, can they relay that detailed story? Um, you know, getting dressed. They dress appropriate for the weather? Is it clean? Is it put on the right way? So don't just, oh yeah, they, they put their, their shorts on today. They can dress themselves. Well, but I had to help them. I had to get the shorts out. They went to grab the dirty ones. You know, and that may not be the case. Yeah, they may be, yep. I don't have to say a word. They come down, they've taken their shower, they got dressed. That's an area that they have no difficulty. But if they do, just I really encourage you to be honest and don't sugarcoat it um, because it can limit their services later. So uh, case that was asked to speak specifically a little bit about case management, and I think I'm running a little slow, so I'll try to pick it up here a little bit. Um, the process for picking a case management company, we have a new term this week. <laughs> we used to have what's called a pick list. We now have called what's called a choice list. So once you find out from Beads, you're told you are approved for a waiver, and they're ready to get you assigned to a case management company. A beads intake specialist will help you get in contact with case management companies. What they're probably going to do is give you, what they call that now the choice list. It's got a list of company names and phone numbers, and simply you call them. Um, there is, they have a form on their website that's to help guide you in picking a case management company. Most of my family say they go by what they feel. Because this, you're about to have this, this company and this family in your home, knowing your, some of your business. We don't need to know everything. You know, they're, they're going to know all the ins and outs of the care for your loved one. And you want to be feel comfortable. And you want to feel confident. So call every single one of those companies. See who you feel comfortable with. And my word of encouragement is when you, if you interview with a company, ask them if it's possible to speak to the specific case manager that they think would be assigned to you. Because I can come interview with you all day long and you may think, oh, she's great. You're like, uh -uh, nope, not coming in my house. But if I'm not the one who's gonna come to your home on a routine basis and be over your case, it's hard to make that decision. Um, and you can't always be guaranteed that you'll get to interview with the exact person, but that's my, my advice. Because um, you just click with some people and some people you just don't click with. Um, so yeah, interview as many. You have freedom of choice. You don't have to make a decision right away. You choose. You are in control throughout this whole process of what companies are involved in your loved one or your own care. So you have that freedom of choice. Um, and I'll talk about the case manager role in just a minute. But once you select a case management company, they're going to have you sign that choice list. And then at that point, that case manager is officially on your case. Um, So along with, you know, after you select a case manager, what is a case manager's role? What, what do I do? What's my responsibility? There's a lot of jargon I could throw at you. Short version, we help define and create the PC, what they call the PCISP, person-centered, individualized support plan. The key to that is person-centered. It's what yourself, your loved one, need of services and, and their plan and goals for life. So 
of course, there's going to be intakes, forms, that kind of thing. You have to sign HIPAA forms every year, just like you do at the doctor's office. You're going to have grievance policies and um, you know things like that. So we're going to create an initial budget. CCB, here's more letters. Cost comparison budget. All that breaks down is what services are in your plan. It's, most of you are going to start out with just case management, and then we can add other services later. The initial support plan, things to keep in mind of um, I want, I need, I will. This plan is to be driven by the participant. Now, when the participant can't speak for themselves, obviously it's going to be driven by the parents or the family. But what do they want? It's not what we as case managers want. It's not what a provider wants. I need. So some examples I came up with, it's I want to manage my, my health care. Some people want to be more involved in their health care and make better decisions. Um, so within that, I need to be involved in scheduling my appointments, and I will keep a calendar. So it's kind of just breaking it down, kind of like if you're at a hospital and you have a treatment plan, or in a school you have an IEP, that's our version of a plan. Um, it can be things like, I want to better communicate my needs. I need to advocate for myself, and I will make one personal request per day. So they'll help you um, set those things up. What's important to and important for? Again, it's about what the participant wants and needs. It's important to me to be as independent in the community as possible. And it's important for my staff to know to set boundaries. That's the kind of information that we want to gather from the families at an intake to put into the plan. Um, at the initial intake, you're going to discuss needs. Um, the case manager should help suggest potential services. Um, if you get a case manager who's experienced, sometimes they're going to think outside the box a little bit more. Not that a new case manager is bad by any means, because you don't know what their previous experience is from. Um, but I had a family tell me, you know, I really don't know. We don't need anything right now. But as we engaged in that conversation, it, the, the young in individual had problems with homework. And he would have what they would call tantrums with homework. It was communication. He doesn't know how to express when he's frustrated or to ask for help. So we brought behavior management in. He's not punching holes in walls. When people hear behavior management, they think, oh my gosh, somebody's out of control or has you know, bad behaviors. But there are so many other services that we think outside the box. Um, I have a gentleman who he tries to isolate. So we brought in recreational therapy. Let's get out in the community and get some activities going for you. I have a client working on um, handwriting skills via music therapy. She doesn't want to sit there and do a, a worksheet about Oh, practice writing your this word, but you work with a music therapist with some of her favorite songs, and she's writing lyrics to her favorite songs. She's working on finger identity on a keyboard because she kind of contracts her hands a lot of times and has to fidget also. So she's learning different ways to isolate her fingers. So you know, processing some of those things out, they can help you look at some service options. Um, our part of our role is to assist with seeking additional services. I don't know how many people in the room know this, so how many people who have waiver participants, when it came to the age of 16 and the discussion of driving was scary? Anybody experience that? Afraid to help teach them how to drive? Maybe they've, you think they've got the potential, but you just really don't know where to start? Did you know there's services to help with that? Vocational rehab will staff an occupational therapist to help teach a participant to drive because that is a job skill. So vocational rehab will help with that. So it's still an option. If you have someone who's still interested, get a voc rehab referral out there and tell them that you want assistance with driving. Um, and again, I think it's great that it's an occupational therapist who does it. It's no offense to another staff, but it's not just someone with a high school diploma coming and say, okay, let's, let's go here in town. Let's learn how to drive. They do testing with them. They can help with accommodations if need be for the written test. I had a participant who just, I mean, he knew all this stuff, but he kept not passing the written test and it was on a computer. Well, after the assessment of the occupational therapist, it was because on the, written, or the computer test, you can't go back and review your answers. They gave him the paper test where he could review his answers after the fact. Done. One time on paper. But if that intervention wasn't there from the occupational therapist, they may not have ever figured that out. So again, that's another one of our rules. We don't know everything, but we also have resources of each other, and we reach out and say, hey, have you ever had this situation? Um, so that's definitely a, a, a positive. And then again, always freedom of choice. When we're looking at other providers or if you just don't like your case manager six months after you bring them in, you can fire them. You can pick another company. You can pick another case manager within that company. You always have freedom of choice. Um, sorry, speed it up here. So there's two types of waivers. Uh, family supports waiver, it's a smaller budget. Those of you who've been around for a long time, it used to be called the SS waiver. 
Um, it is the most common. It is very difficult anymore to get the CIH waiver. Maximum budget right now on a family support waiver is $19,614. Some, with some services, that doesn't go very far. You know, behavior management, for example, it's a pricey service. It's a valuable service, but it's pricey, so it goes away quickly. Um, when it comes to the family supports waiver, the, the budget doesn't vary. So if you've got a high level of need or a low level of need, it doesn't matter. That's a across the board set budget. And you cannot apply for temporary increases in um, budgets. On the CIH waiver, or the community integration and habilitation waiver, as we call the big waiver because you get the big budget, um, the budget is based on an ALGO level, which ALGO just stands for algorithm. Um, it's based on a level of need. It looks at both your medical and behavioral needs. Um, it can be anywhere from a $40,000 budget, $120,000 budget. Big difference from your family supports waiver. One of the other differences is that it does allow for emergency adjustments or that Beamer that I talked about that's not down on the parking lot um, or to al review the allocation. So that you know, if somebody's in a behavioral crisis, they've had something happen and all of a sudden we're getting a bunch of psychiatric stays or physical aggression. On that community integration, we can ask for temporary extra hours for behavior management or for one-on-one -on -one staffing. Someone has a hospital stay and they come home with a lot more medical needs. We can apply for a Beamer or a budget modification review to get some extra direct care staff in there to help them. Um, it is, again, more difficult to obtain. Those who've been around for a while probably remember the times when it was the SS and the DD waiver and it was you apply on a certain date and that's the date that they start pulling from. So you might be on it 10 years and like, oh, they're, they're almost to my date. I'm going to get that big waiver soon. And it was. It was just a matter of attrition of the dates. When it got closer to your date being pulled, then your loved one was going to get that larger waiver. When they changed to the FSW and the CIH, that was no longer the process. I remember having a family who was devastated. I was on the provider side and it was like, six months from their application date is what they were reviewing for the big waiver at that time. And they were like, oh, we're going to get it. And then it changed and that no longer mattered. Um, so there are priori priority criteria. Unfortunately, they're not great. Um, things like death of a caregiver. So if you know, you're a parent taking care of them and you pass away, you get priority criteria. Substantiated abuse and neglect in the home. Um, caregiver over 80. 80. I mean, that's, that's a lot for taking care of someone if they've got a lot of behavioral or medical needs. Um, sometimes a substantial change in medical or behavioral status can get approval, but it's another one of those things too. I say if you're questioning, if you might qualify, apply and make them deny you. And if they deny you and you still feel qualified, go for an appeal. Um, the state prefers that you go from the family support waiver to, I want to say they prefer, I can't speak for them. Often they encourage that you go to, someone goes to a group home in between the two waivers but that's just not a good match for some people. I got a guy waiting on a kidney transplant. If he gets that transplant, a group home is not a safe place for him when it comes to isolation and things like that. So they do take some of those things into consideration. Through appeal, we got that individual, his CIH waiver. You don't always get that. Um, I, I, the two that I've gotten recently have been medical related. Uh, we appealed, and Gavin was on dialysis and was about to lose her dialysis because of behaviors and, and communication disorder. Communication, and she was gonna get kicked out you can't go without dialysis. So we um, applied and were able to get her approved. Um, I'm almost done here, guys. So some common services, residential or PAC, those are your in-home services. It's just a difference between the two waivers. Um, I'm just gonna hit on a couple of these and I apologize because I know there's some other things that need to be talked about. Remote supports. When people hear remote supports, a lot of times they think cameras. Remote supports have come a long way from when it was just you know video monitoring. I've, they can be just as much as like a phone reminder to take medications. The options for independence via remote supports, and I'll, I'll admit it took me a minute to wrap my head around agreeing with remote supports because again, I thought cameras and monitoring, but someone wants to be independent and they don't want staff on the weekends, but they sometimes struggle with getting their medication taken. That program can be set up via usually an iPad that if they know their medication times, they will call into this client at eight o'clock in the morning on Saturday all right, Johnny, Sally, have you taken your medications? They'll watch them, they'll talk to them, how you doing? And if there's ever an incident, they send a report. Remote supports can put um, sensors in the home that learn patterns. If it's common that, you know, on Sunday morning, this individual's up and moving around because they're getting ready for church, and that Sunday morning, those sensors aren't triggering. Nobody's moving in that house. That alerts them to call and say, are you okay? Maybe they just slept in. Maybe they've fallen on the floor. We don't know. 
but remote supports really has come a long ways. And if you think that you have a loved one who could benefit from some more independence with those types of services, they can get expensive. I will be honest um, as far as budget utilization, but I really encourage that remote supports is, uh, and especially as we face these staffing crises, we've got to get more creative with how we use these services and how we can support those that receive waiver um, funding. Another one, I transportation. If you have, I have clients who, other than case management, they use transportation to buy their bus passes to keep them independent to get to and from work. To me, that's beneficial. They're not having to rely on mom and dad or a provider. They can do that independently. They go get their bus pass. They often are the one who schedule their bus to get to and from work. Um, so again, just some of those outside uh, thoughts. Um, and then wellness, though, I will say is one that's harder to get. Um, usually that's only in a 24-hour. It's only available on the CIH. I should have put that. Um, and it um, usually only in 24-hour supported living sites. If someone's got a medical need that they need to be followed by a nurse, you know, once a week, once every other week, that's where wellness comes in. Um, and then personal emergency response, that's the help I've fallen and I can't get up button. That can be paid through waiver. So again, another um, independent living thing that... Um, and it's, that's an inexpensive service. I want to say it's like 50 some dollars a month. So that's um, a good service to have also. So like I said, those people that aren't sure that they want to take on waiver, all it takes to maintain it is you must, well, the first thing is you must maintain case management services. That is the only service requirement for the waiver is you always have to have a case manager. Um, you have to continue to meet eligibility or level of care requirements. So those questions I talked about with economic self-sufficiency, uh, self-care, you still have to have need levels there. Maintain asset limits, that's not parents' income, that's the individual doesn't have a bank account with $5,000 in it. Typical Medicaid, oh, I, I wrote down the number and forgot, it's like 2200 or something like that now. Um, and any account that has their name on it, don't think, oh, we've already got a savings account set up for them. That savings account counts. So if you are at a point where someone's gonna have too much money, there are trust accounts that you might wanna look into. Um, sometimes families are like, well, we're just saving it. It's not in their checking account. It's still got their name on it. It's still their assets. So make sure that you're ca cautious of that. And then attend quarterly meetings. If there's no other services, it's probably 30 minutes or less. Any health care updates? Do you want to talk about new services? You know, that's kind of the extent of what those meetings become. Um, I know Michelle's got a questions thing at the end. Is there anything real quick that I can answer that anybody has? Okay. Thank you. Thank you, Bridget. Okay, our um, next speaker is Kathleen McGowan. She's a career-long hospital administrator with IU Health, Bloomington, and Community Health Network. She has um, been the past and is the current board, on the current board and committee involvement with Benchmark Human Services, ILAD, Giving Hope, the Arc of Indiana, and the Governor's Task Force, which is what she's going to focus on tonight. Um, Kathleen is a mom to Scott who is 22 years old, who is significantly affected by autism, and they are currently going through a difficult transition from leaving school services to the adult um, services and the day, day habilitation options. Uh, she and her husband, John, have two older daughters in addition to Scott and also two adorable granddaughters. Good evening, everyone. Um, it's really a pleasure to be here tonight. And before I kind of start a few comments, um, how many moms and dads do we have in here tonight? Okay. Are most of your kiddos older? Uh, over 20, 20, yeah, yeah, okay. I don't know about you, but boy, life really changed <laughs> when they went from little kiddos to all of their needs to adults and thinking about the rest of their life, rest of your life <laughs> and the rest of their lives. Uh, it's just been, uh, as Michelle said in, in, our, in my intro, um, really feel like we've been at the front end of a lot of hard life lessons in the last couple of years transitioning out of, um, of school and then just figuring out where Scott goes, what he does and, and such. And he's a great kid. He's very affected by his autism. He's nonverbal. He's a 24-7 kid. Uh, has a lot of behavior issues. And just to give you some idea, we're, 
we start our third attempt at a day program next week. So um, it's just, it's hard to find the right level of services and such, and I don't know if you can relate to any of that, but um, organizations like ILAD that can help us navigate are just um, really a, a blessing. So, um, so all of that said, uh, I wanted to talk with you uh, about the, um, the, the task force. How many of you are familiar with the governor's task force? Raise of hand. Okay, a couple. Okay. Um, and I would suggest that um, we're really in a good place as moms and dads and family members of folks and, and self-advocates as well for disability services um, because of the task force. Uh, I do not work for the state. <laughs> um, I'm one of the very few people on the task force that are not employed by the state. Uh, I've gotten to know many of them a lot better. The lieutenant governor has a big heart for people with disabilities. We're really lucky to have her at the um, leading the pack, if you will. And uh, just to let you know that the state really had not done this kind of work since the late 90s, uh, which I don't know about you, but I was not in this world back in the late 90s. We, we entered it uh, around 2002 for, for our son. Uh, but in the late 90s, if you were part of this world back then and this part of this community, uh, it was when we still had institutions. And so we were closing down the institutions and transitioning to people, people to um, more supportive living, hence the waiver development. And we had, and I, I don't know exactly all of the history here, but we, I, my understanding is we had some of the, the beginnings of the waiver, but really in the early 2000s, it opened up and the state put a lot more services, a lot more funding into the waiver because, um, because they were shutting down the institutions and sort of those kinds of traditional um, uh, places of, of service and kind of pushing that out to the community. And we know that there's so many benefits to that. Uh, I don't know about your kiddos and such, but that's really the goal is to integrate and just like ILAD and the, the community, a diverse community and all those kinds of, those are really important things. Um, and there's challenges with that too. So we hadn't, at a, as a state, done any kind of assessment since the late 90s. Um, and back then it was called the 317 Commission. And then the leadership of uh, Governor Holcomb and Lieutenant Governor um, Crouch really, uh, and uh, Senator, um, I'm sorry, Representative Ed Clear out of New Albany and, and others who authored the original 1102 bill, it was a House bill. Uh, it was the first time in almost a couple of decades that put some uh, focus on taking a look at services uh, for people with uh, disabilities and hence the 1102 task force was, was formed. So that all happened in 2017 and the idea of the 1102 task force was to pull together 21 different individuals. Uh, as I mentioned, the majority of them are somehow connected to the state, you know, like the head of mental health division, the head of special education division, all those guys. So all of those professional individuals, there's two of us that are parents, and, and then there are some legislators who are part of that as well. And we spent an entire year uh, going all around the state of Indiana and having these parent meetings, or I should say family meetings, in different parts of, of the state and inviting people in to just share their hearts. Uh, and we did that for, for a year. Um, I'll never forget one of probably, I mean, it was just gut-wrenching at, at times. You know, people, we'd open it up and have, um, people come up to the mic. We do that for an hour, hour plus, every single meeting. And, you know, I mean, you all know the, the ups and the downs and the heartaches and the hard stuff that we're dealing with as parents. Um, and people would come and share their hearts. And we heard a lot of themes, a lot of themes about staffing, a lot of themes about not, you know, being able to recruit DSPs. Um, because we're not paying them anything, you know, all of those kinds of common things, services, uh, et cetera, and such. Um, and I'll never forget the w one comment that just sort of hit me between the eyes um, was a woman who was probably in her mid-60s, and she had a brother who was a year or two younger than she was. And you know, you often hear that saying where parents will say, and it's a little on the 
morbid side maybe, but <laughs> you know, um, but it's something along the line is you hope your child kind of goes like around the same time you do, you know, some version of that. And this sister who had a, you know, 63 year old brother at the time made that same comment. And I thought, wow, this, you know, I mean, our families, there's so many families that are really, um, you know, bearing big burdens and the state needs to really do what they can and come alongside all the more. So, so the task force listened for uh, a year and put together a very elaborate plan. Um, what I'm showing you here, and I did not include that, uh, these links on that one piece of paper, you might write down at the very top where you can find this if you're interested, but all of this information is public. Um, the task force meets twice a year. Um, we're we're uh, required to do that by, le by the legislation. And people, we, you can zoom into it. You can actually, in October, we meet next, next week. Um, parents, families can become, be, be part of those meetings. There's, there's always public um, you know, invite into those meetings. So really encourage you to do that. And uh, after a year long, the, um, the result of the 1102 task force was a pretty elaborate plan. There are four different areas uh, that the plan is developed around, and within those four areas, there are 34 different goals uh, in the next, um, I think it's a, I, we've got it written as a seven to 10 year plan. Okay, and those, those goals are everything from housing to uh, voc rehab to educational goals to integration to things like first steps. It's kind of looking at the entirety of the world that we live in. I know many of those things don't affect all of us, but looking at all of those services that, that, that um, uh, is kind of part of the, the, the journey that we travel. And there's lots of, of really good goals to um, look for improvement, look for uh, increased funding or shifting funding from one area to another those kinds of things. And of those 34 goals, there's actually at least five goals that have to do with housing. So we know, you know, in general, we know that there's such a, a shortage of housing and housing options uh, available for our, for our folks. And um, so that, that plan from the 1102 task force um, was really uh, kind of built to help um, navigate through some of that in the, in the upcoming years. At the end of the year, the 1102 task force realized that now that we have this plan, we actually need kind of ongoing monitoring uh, and accountability for those who have uh, operational responsibility to make those, those goals happen. And so there was additional legislation written, it's um, House Bill 1488, I believe it was, and that started in 2018. And so we've all been um, kind of uh, deemed to continue on in the process, and, and that will happen until 2025. So we meet twice a year, and, um, and all of those 34 goals, uh, there's a status report, people are kind of coming and presenting to us and um, hopefully making things move forward. Um, probably some of the most recent activity uh, that has happened around those goals is around waiver redesign. And Bridget did a, a wonderful job sharing kind of how it is today. Um, but part of the 1102 plan was to actually kind of look at the overall waiver structure and say, does that still work? And as, as Bridget talked about, there are two different waiver options. Um, and there had been some conversation about, well, maybe we need three or four or a handful of different waiver options rather than just the two. So I'm not sure where that's going yet. We haven't really made any decisions or progress about that. Where the waiver redesign process, um, some of the changes that are, have been occurring is around case management innovation. And there is a, um, another website. Well, you can see this link right here. The other tab at the top. That should be able to take us. Case management in, uh, innovation. And it really is a, 
a process of looking at, there were currently 10 uh, case management companies and the state was wanting to um, reduce that. Um, so they've recently done that, uh, reduced that to six different case management companies that will work with the waivers. There's some other um, uh, changes around how those case management companies are being paid. Before it was, a, they were being paid like they were a provider and now it's more of a contract. So some, some uh, differences sort of behind the scenes that probably as parents and moms and dads, we wouldn't notice that so much. I mean, it still comes out of our waiver dollars to pay for those services. Um, but uh, some changes happening there. And really the motivation for that, to start with that area of case management information was really around increasing communication, um, helping kind of that person-centered plan be, um, you know, be, get more people involved with that um, and helping the families navigate better. Also some uh, pretty high and specific quality uh, initiatives around the, that case management and innovation as well. So, so really, um, what I did encourage you to do is, if you're interested, keep your eye out on the 1102 task force. We still call ourselves that, I think. Um, uh, the 1102, the disability task force, to see what changes are coming down the pike. Um, and as much as you are able to, um, get involved, come and, you know, be part of the conversation um, because really the, the task force members need to hear input from families. It really does make a difference. So I will pause at that and see, are there specific questions? Yes, sir. So when this task force meets, meets by a Zoom, is then there an opportunity for caregivers our parents uh, to say, you know, how, how are you going to address this problem? What do you see as improvements in this area? Yeah. Great question. And, um, you know, before COVID, we were all in person, and it was still being televised and, and um, all sorts of adaptations for people to kind of log in. But to answer your question, next week is the first time that the group will come together in the last year and a half. But it still is also held virtually. So yes, there are opportunities. You can come down to the State House and be part of the gathering or can watch it. Well, through Zoom, mm -hmm. you have the capabilities if yes. they allow it yeah. to make comments. Yes, yeah. So do you know if that's going to happen? Or don't know? Um, I don't, I can't recall the last couple of meetings that we've had, how much input we've had, you know, how much uh, real time input we've had um, on that. Do you, want, do you know what date that is? Uh -huh. Yeah, it's uh, next Thursday, October the 14th, and we go from 10 to 2, and it's down at the State House. And that information, if we go back to this tab here, all of the notes, this is all public information. Every note from the very beginning <laughs> um, is, is available on this website. All the meeting agendas, the minutes, the recordings, public comments, all of that information is, is there. And, you know, I'd highly suggest that you get involved with your legislators and let them know that you've got your eye on this, and, and hopefully they do too. Yeah. Thank you. Uh-huh. Yes. Yes, ma'am. Uh, I know Richard said to interview the providers, and you said there's only six providers. Is that for both the, um, the I forget the two acronyms? <laughs> yeah, <laughs> both. Both the family support and the CIH waiver, yes. And that is very recent change. That all came out last Friday. And we as... Um, we got our notice today. Yeah, yeah. I did too, actually. Um, and there's a webinar. Uh, there's a couple of them, but I know that there's one. Uh, Beads is having a webinar on October 18th uh, to share some more information about that. My understanding is that we've gone from 10 to 6. This is what I've been told. And of the four that are no longer part of the equation, that represented about 
of the people on the waiver. So the majority of the, you know, over 80% of us um, will not have a change in case management companies. Okay, okay so. There was actually like 12 companies. Um, and it, the spec takes, takes effect on January 1st. Yes. So I mean, I, I'm on one of those companies that's now seeking other options. Um, but so that does take effect on January 1st. Is there a, plate, a link that's going to show us the six on that website? The Indiana it is on the case management innovations one. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll show you. You can see if yours is on there or not. And and you should be getting uh, correspondence from your current case management company, regardless yeah, of the. One yet. We're yeah. just on the wait list. Okay. Yeah, and the, technically, the beads is telling families right now that so the all twelve of us are still an option at the moment. Um, but it does say on there that as of, if you pick, for example, if you picked futures case management today, which is the company I work for, you are being told that just so you know, you have to pick again by January 1st, because we only have a, we are only an approved provider through December 31st. But there should be on that. Yeah, it's on. It was on, I thought they put it on their main yeah. innovations page. It is on here, I know it is. There's also the BEADS Facebook page. Indiana um, Bureau of Development and Disability Services does have their own Facebook page. And that does have information about the webinars. It has information about um, the case management innovation announcement and all of that information. But again, like she said, those who already have a case manager, you should be being contacted by your case manager in addition to the state. Yeah, and I believe that um, for those families that 16 or, or so percent of uh, those individuals or those families that have to make a change, they have until, I think it's December the 4th. 14th. 14th. Yep. That yeah. choice list has to be signed by December the 14th. Yeah. So so there's there's some time. Are these six case managements totally separate from the VR case management? Yes. Whole different process. Yep. Can't have a combo one. <laughs> right. No, and it really, we work. Case managers work with VR. When I have my quarterly meetings, there are teams that no rehab is present at. So, like, we kind of work in conjunction. You know, they work with behavior specialists and say, okay, do we need to focus on behavior right now, or are we okay to start working on job skills, or what do we need behavior or someone else to work on to be job ready? That kind of thing. So that's and VR doesn't come out of your budget. It's a completely separate entity and services that doesn't impact your waiver itself. Uh -huh. And I will say that is really one of the, the benefits or has been one of the benefits of the 1102 task force is it's pulling together all the heads of the departments at the state level for education, mental health, as well as beads and uh, DDRS and all of that. I mean, those and, and, and I'm not suggesting that they never talk, but they, they don't talk as much as they have been talking because of the 1102 in, in terms of coordinating and trying to find programs. An example of that is at our next task force meeting, um, we're spending a lot of time on the 988 initiative, which is the uh, National Suicide Prevention um, Initiative. And there's some funding for that. We're gonna learn all about it. So I, I would not, I don't profess at all to really be uh, know enough to, to tell you more than that. But the implications to that, as I understand it, have to do with crisis management for our folks. So there may be resources, there may be some infrastructure that we can finally build in the area of crisis management, which I don't know if, if that is, affects you, but affects a lot of families. And as a state, we have pretty much not much. <laughs> so. Recently turned 22 but received a diagnosis before 22, can you still apply for beads even though they're older than 22? Oh yeah, you can apply for, for beads waivers. We had somebody on our, one of our coworkers' caseloads that didn't get the waiver until they're 59 years old. So as long as you were diagnosed prior to age 22, you can apply whenever you need to. And I forgot one thing I think they gave you a copy of as far as um, case manager roles and some of those extra things we do sometimes. Um, sharing of resources is important. So they gave you, I believe, an example of, I sent out like about once a quarter a news update that talks about um, information. Oh, apparently since I didn't talk about it, I still had it. Um, it talks about, you know, services and like the access pass in Indianapolis to get discounted admission to certain museums and things. Um, my next one's going to include some information about SNAP benefits and how those have recently changed. Um, so there, that's not a requirement of case management by any means, but um, sometimes it's good to share those resources and I've put some ILAD information in there 
to, um, you know, when families are looking for some groups. It's, I, I just feel like there's not a good place that everybody gets all the information, so the more that we can share as case managers with our families, the better. Um, I had a, another case manager share with me a, a book club that's more towards the northeast side, more of the Fishers area. Oh my gosh, one of my clients was so excited because she's been looking for anything to do. And there's a book club up there um, that meets in Fishers. So, Thank you. again, that's not a requirement. And you'll notice there's a, that was right before my vacation, so there is about my personal vacation coverage in there. Um, but so I try to send those out once in a while just to share some, some resource information. Your contact info? Um, I probably have some business cards in my um, thing I can give you. probably better give my cell phone number at this point, not knowing where the next three months takes me. And here's a list of the six that have been selected. Thank you, both Bridget and Kathleen. Um, I wanted to mention that ILAD's next program is going to be kind of run in conjunction to this. So typically we would have our informational workshops and then we had a program called Family Connect where we would try to dive in a little deeper to whatever that topic is. So for this month, our next meeting is going to be held on October 21st and we are going to have a panel of providers who represent different companies and different services on the waiver. So. For example, I am a behavior consultant outside of ILAD. I'm a behavior consultant um, waiver provider. Um, and we're going to have a rec therapist, a music therapist, and a residential therapist, our residential services uh, representative. Um, I think you already have received your surveys. Um, I would ask if you have anything specific that you think would be very helpful for us to cover on the 21st, please make that a note for that. Like if you're specifically interested in remote services or something that Bridget had shared um, during her talk, please feel free to make a note of that. We're going to try to have as many representatives as we can. Um, and um, let's see. Bridget mentioned the hyperlinks. I will send out an email to follow up um, that will include her PowerPoint and uh, the hyperlinks that she had shared in addition to the two websites that Kathleen referenced today. So you should have an, a follow up email um, either through your registration or if you've signed, if, if you weren't registered tonight and you signed up on the form, you will, you will get that. Um, but we're going to try to do as you know, talk about what does the waiver look like and how can it help you get your self-advocate to a more independent status, whether that's in your home or transitioning into their own home. So um, we are going to try to um, answer as many questions as we can. Any other questions about the waiver to either Bridget or Kathleen at this time? Okay. Would anyone like the slides from Bridget's uh, presentation? Yes. Yeah. Okay. How about I just send it out to everyone and I will include those two links. I will include her hyperlinks and a copy of her um, PowerPoint presentation as well. Yep. <laughs> yeah, so you can actually read them. <laughs> well, if you have a case manager currently, I don't want to step on anyone's toes, but one of my biggest things I want people to have as much information as possible. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to ask me um, you know, about resources, things, whatever. I post that on my Facebook constantly. Um, if you know somebody who just wants somebody to talk to about getting services, because it's not about having people on my caseload, because I am one of those people who are reducing my caseload. You know, so it's not that I need to build my, my list or anything like that. I want people to have the information. There's too much lack of information out there. And anything I can do to help share information, I would love to do that. So, again, if it's something specific about your plan, that needs to go to your case manager. You know, I, I do not want to step on another case manager's toes. But if there's something I can, you know, if you've got a question or something that I can help with, please, you know, I'll help in any way that I can. Thank you. Yeah, her newsletter is kind of the thing that sold me on her because... I know no other case manager <laughs> that takes it upon themselves just to share all the information and kind of get the resources out there. So um, I thought that was pretty, um, spoke a lot to her character and who she is and just that she wants to be a service to everybody. So um, 
that's the other thing. If you want, you can get on her mailing list. If you'd like to kind of speak with her directly, we can get you on her mailing list for future newsletters. Okay, if we don't have any other questions, I am probably just going to um, end with um, tonight's session. Please feel free to visit with each other, enjoy some snacks, um, complete your survey. Again, if you have any recommendations on things that you would like to have included in the panel on October 21st, which is same time in the same exact location, um, we hope that you are able to come back. Um, I just want to thank both Bridget and Kathleen for taking the time out of their busy schedules to come and share their information with us. Um, and then I just want to specifically um, thank the ILAD program committee, uh, Deb Easterday, Lisa Hurtabies, uh, Jill is outside, I think, um, and then Lisa Batts, who is not with us tonight. But um, that's the, the power behind all of these things are, are these uh, four ladies. So um, thank you to them. And um, if you have anything else, please let either myself or Bridget or Kathleen know directly. Thanks for coming. <laughs>